<laughs> so how did you come up with the idea for NextCloud? Oh, yeah, that's a long story. So um, at the time, I was deeply involved in the KDE project, oh, cool. the Linux desktop. This was actually my, my first uh, open source project where I got into like, in the 90s uh, still. And I was really blown away that you can people come together over the internet and write this software, which is, in my opinion, like as good as Windows 95, which was like very common at the time. Um, so I was really, really blown away by that. And then I got involved in the KDE project. Uh, but then a little bit, uh, or 10 years later, it became clear that a lot of people still use Linux on the desktop, but then they use a lot of online services that just use Gmail for mail and Dropbox for their, uh, for, their, for their files and so on. And then there is no real freedom anymore, right? And you have in control of your desktop, fine, but all the data and all the communication is flowing through some proprietary um, software run by other people. And then I thought, okay, we need to also like revolutionize the server part a bit that you have this online services, collaboration services, communication, sharing, but um, self-hosted and open source. So this was the original idea. What gave me the confidence to start a company around open source is that I'd seen a few different approaches to the commercial side of open source, and they were both wildly different. Because I think when Canonical started and Ubuntu was created, the it was, a, it was at a time when if you could get eyeballs and could get users, you would automatically assumed you would be able to monetize it. And that wasn't as easy as I might have thought it would have been. And for a while, I would say probably our greatest uh, source of revenue was Ubuntu t-shirts. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. That doesn't surprise me. I mean, as weird as it sounds, yeah. it doesn't surprise yeah, but, me. But honestly, that was the first the first year or so because we, we just, Mark had this grand vision and obviously Red Hat had got some traction, but Red Hat, even at the time, was a tiny company relatively to, to, to the other um, sort of IT companies or BMS that were out there. And I think it was all around, I think Mark had great visions of maybe an, an alternative to, to like the Apple ecosystem, but open and free. And, and obviously you, you, you must be aware of the name Ubuntu, meaning humanity to others and humanity to all. So I had this mm -hmm. great mission uh, led. And on day one, I was introduced to the concept of uh, one of our goals as being uh, squashing bug number one, which was um, beating Microsoft. So it was it was all of like it was very much like a it was a it was a it was a movement. It was a passion. It was uh, quite evangelical, uh, quite, quite evangelical. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people that joined uh, Canonical early days were huge open source advocates. Mm -hmm. Like like they were like it, it was it was written into their very DNA and, and soul. And so you know we had people join the company who'd been like Linus Torvalds roommate you know we had a lot of the the early sort of contributors to the to the you know working with Stallman around the licensing and then uh early contributors to Linux kernel so we had like I, that was kind of the world that I was I was kind of uh introduced to here's me as a as a grad as a grad uh who'd just come off three years uh, doing door-to-door -door sales at university thinking how am I going to make money from from uh from this this and uh not really working at for a long time had to kind of do that mm. uh when when like i said a lot of the only thing that was kind of selling relatively easy was the uh, was the merchandise <laughs> yeah uh you know so appsmith is an open source uh, platform for uh, you know developers to just build all of their internal tools um uh, i myself have been a developer that had to build internal tools and uh, i never really liked doing it because internal tools always got the least bandwidth uh, the least engineering bandwidth least product bandwidth pretty much zero design bandwidth, right? And um, because of that, internal tooling is in a really poor state. Uh, most internal tools uh, look really terrible. Uh, they're just not reliable. They're, they're underperformant, uh, slow and janky. Um, and, you know, that kind of set uh, us down on this path that, you know, why can't we make internal tools as good as like the best SaaS software out there? You know, I mean, sure, they're custom, but a lot of their code building blocks are the same. So what if we could just, you know, create a platform for, you know, engineering teams to actually you reuse a lot of the core building blocks um, and be able to configure them and put them together in a way that uh, makes sense for their business. Um, and that's kind of how AppSmith was born um, and also kind of why it's open source because it's super engineering focused. It's for developers um, to just kind of be able to get their internal tool, the tooling needs out the door much quicker. Simple words, Begisto is an open source e-commerce platform. So basically, if you're looking to start your e-commerce shop, so you can just use this open source framework and start your e-commerce shop in just a few minutes, okay? 
um this is a very interesting story how it got started so uh, as i told you webcool is the payment company of existio and webcool has been working in e-commerce sector from past 10 years right so five years back uh, uh, it was it's, it's the story for and half year five years back when begisto was the thought of begisto came in the mind of mr vipin sahu okay that uh, there are so many developers who are working on different different e-commerce platform but the learning curve of those development platform or the e-commerce platform were like too large like it it took a developer like around uh, like six months to one year to first learn a framework and then start customizing and building the e-commerce shop so that's the one gap we find we always wanted to make something which should be easy to learn the learning curve should be small so any developer can easily try to get their hands on begisto and start building a framework that's the first gap second thing we started that on which tech stack we should build begisto so let me tell you that begisto is built on laravel which is uh, currently one of the most popular php backend framework so at that time also there were many other frameworks like symphony was there symphony is still there there was cake php there was coding writer and there's laravel okay so we find that laravel has a very good uh, footprint across the world but what laravel was missing is a very good e-commerce shop so we have been dealing with other companies who are working on laravel and we asked them suppose if you get a project on e-commerce what do you do so they either tell them that uh, that uh, it's quite impossible to build on laravel you just go go and search for other frameworks or they build on scratch so it took a lot of time so we wanted to fill this gap between the laravel developers and the e-commerce ecosystem by bringing a solution which would be easy for them to help them to build the e-commerce shop so i think these two are the very basic reason that we want to make a platform driven commerce which would be easy for the new grown developers who have worked on a simple mbc architecture as well they can easily learn the platform and start building the e-commerce shop and we want to connect the laravel developer ecosystem to the e-commerce ecosystem so we thought of building this platform on laravel and as open source uh, around kind of 2016 uh it was late 2016 early 2017 yahoo contributed that so donate that to the apache software foundation they they did a lot for their infrastructure software like the entire hadoop uh, ecosystem was actually donated by uh, by yahoo uh, by yahoo to apache software foundation so was that like a part of yahoo's culture to do stuff like that or was that something that took a lot of convincing or how did how did those discussions go I think that's that exactly I think is Yahoo's culture and Yahoo make this uh, became a culture of Silicon Valley. So Yahoo is probably the first uh, company that donate donating I would say the entire Hadoop stack to uh, uh, Apache Software Foundation and a lot of these uh, companies like LinkedIn, Uber, or even Twitter is they open source tons of the the project is because they they like the culture that is a is an open culture and they like to um, kind of share the information infrastructure uh, to uh, to the public so people can leverage that and more importantly for a lot of these uh, infrastructure software due to the complexity you for a single uh, company you, you don't have uh, tons of resources to kind of support and running and improving that uh, infrastructure uh, so leveraging a broader community um, that is able to kind of improve uh, that infrastructure and be able to uh, kind of apply the infrastructure across different use cases you can leverage different workloads to, to battle test that infrastructure make it really solid and reliable so oh, um yeah so let let me let me jump into this so so twitter and and both yahoo have spun off many different startups and the original startup that you had talked about coming out of twitter was streamlio yeah. right um which yeah. was it was a new company that was founded and it was was it specifically founded around pulsar as well uh no at the beginning is actually uh, uh, so twitter uh has this open source technology called storm it's a streaming computing engine and at Twitter, we built another kind of a, a, a next generation called Heron. So at the beginning, the, uh, the idea is the, okay, let's uh, commercialize Heron because we the, in the market, there's tons of the open source uh, Storm users. And so the, the idea is, okay, let's found a company around Heron. But we quickly realized, okay, uh, 
only if you only have a computing engine, it doesn't solve the problem for a lot of enterprises. So we need to build an end-to-end -end solution. So I bring in um, my ex co-worker Matteo Murley into Streamlio, and then we start looking into an end-to-end -end solution, and that's where. Uh, Pulsar was uh, just donated to the Apache Software Foundation, and so we worked together on incubating that project in the Apache Foundation uh, because we need that end-to-end uh, -end solution. Okay, and you and when you were at Streamlio, you were more on the technical side. You weren't in yeah. the executive. Okay, and so you were part of a team, and you're like, we're building this cool thing, we're incubating, and then the company got sold. <laughs> so how was uh, that yeah. like? Like what? What? what you know, you, you were you were thinking, ah, oh, we're going to build this cool thing, and then you, you ended up somewhere else. Um, that, that's got to be a little jarring. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Um, I, I I was one of the uh, one was the co-founder, but I'm more focused on the uh, kind of engineer and technical side, and is more looking into kind of uh, how we are building this end-to-end -end solution. And at, I think our mindset there is still uh, when you're building an open source uh, say, project, the most important thing is the the first thing is the um, uh, you have the new uh, really build a community. So uh, before you're talking about building product, you have the building project. So you have to find project community fit. So if you are not able to not not every open source project uh, can build a community. Uh, I mean, there's tons of the uh, kind of uh, open source, open I would say source available project in on GitHub, but not not everyone is able to build a community. So in 2021, uh, with uh, Alexei Palashchenko and Peter Zaitsev, we figured that it's time. We actually went to this epic journey to the base camp of K2 in the Himalayas. And you know, this takes weeks to go there and, and get back from there optimally. And, um, and uh, you know, after a while you run out of topics and that's when we started talking about MongoDB. <laughs> First you talk about family and about memories from Percona and the mountains and whatever, but after a while, you know, we've been sleeping in this tent on the glacier itself. And, uh, you know, you have no internet, no electricity, no nothing. It's a very uh, nomad experience. And, and yeah, that's, that's how we ended up talking about uh, uh, FerretDB, how there's, um, we were called MangoDB, by the way. Uh, so not FerretDB back then. But that's when we came up with the idea that probably it's time to, to, to come up with an open source alternative to MongoDB and, you know, the special thing about the idea is that many would approach, you know, just rewriting the whole thing from the ground up, but you know, that takes 10 years or so with a database until people start trusting the thing. Look at what happens with MySQL or Postgres, where it took a lot of time for them to, to, to become what they are. And, uh, and uh, we decided to do something different. We decided to um, build the whole thing uh, powered by Postgres. So FerretDB is a MongoDB compatible document database built on Postgres as we are using Postgres as our, um, as our database backend. You know, I think this was vastly easier than the com previous companies I've worked with. And the reason is ClickHouse is just really fast, very capable, and a lot of people needed it. So for example, we had people in financial services that were seeing it as a replacement for Microsoft SQL Server or KDB Plus, which is a very capable, but extremely expensive in-memory database. And uh, so there were people who wanted to write us checks. That said, getting to those, you know, finding the people and letting them know that both ClickHouse exists, they tended to find that on their own. But then on top of that, that we exist, that was the hard part. So it was really marketing that was mm. the single hardest thing. And and we think of ClickHouse as being very popular, but it's, but ClickHouse is a niche. I mean, every, in fact, every data database, other than the big folks, like, you know, MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, they're essentially niche products. So you're always, your biggest challenge is always tell people, get people to recognize how great this is. So that was, that marketing was was really the hardest challenge. Um, and then um, beyond that, 
was because the company was was bootstrapped, you know, just once you got the message out, you know, the company, you know, you're going to close contracts, you're going to, you know, start with uh, services, you're going to start building software for people, then it's just delivery. Can you hire people at the, just the right time so that you don't, you got enough people to deliver on the contract, but you don't have so many that you run out of money. That balance is also, uh, you know, something that we focused on quite a bit. 